Hello, welcome to the Harry Glorikian Show, where we dive into the tech-driven future of healthcare. You've heard me say many times before that AI is going to change almost everything about the way drugs get developed and the way healthcare gets delivered. If anything, I'm even more convinced of that now than I was a year ago or five years ago. And there's probably nobody better placed to see how this transformation is already happening than today's guest, Scott Penberthy. Scott works at Google Cloud, where he's the director of applied AI in the office of the CTO. He and his team work with Google's big corporate customers to help them solve business problems that require large scale computing and deep learning. That includes a variety of customers in healthcare and pharmaceutical R&D. Scott compares Google's cloud computing capabilities to a race car that can be adapted to any type of race. Whether that's a customer like Ginkgo Bioworks that leans on computation to reprogram bacterial cells to pump out pharmaceuticals and other products, or a giant health network like Anthem that uses AI to deliver personalized services to members. Because Scott helps set up these partnerships and because he gets the first look at Google's emerging product and services, he has a unique picture of how computing is changing the everyday practice of doing R&D and running a healthcare company. As he himself puts it, he's in the catbird seat which is what made this conversation so fun. Throughout the interview, you'll hear Scott and me basically geeking out about the latest advances in AI, because both of us share the same amazement about how far things have come and the same excitement about how much more is just around the corner. So without further ado, here's my full conversation with Scott. Hey Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, Harry. Great to be here. I mean, you know, I've been talking to you off and on for a while now, but it's, it's, it's good to have you on the show. And I, I, you know, I've got a whole list of sort of questions and, and thoughts I want to go through with you. And I mean, it was funny because I know when we just started this, I was like, this must be the most exciting time on earth for you guys, considering everything that's going on in AI right now. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where, you know, I jump out of bed like at five and I annoy my kids. <laughs> Dad, go, what, why do you get up at five, four? I'm like, there's so much going on. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, I, you know, I'm just a student of this. I've been, I've been studying this for a few decades and I'm barely a student now. I mean, it's a hundred papers a day. <laughs> and so like, how the heck do you keep up with that? So we, what we do inside Google and I'm, I have some uh, companies who do the same thing. We just swap like, hey, what's cool? And you, it, just to figure that out figure out like where's this thing going i mean it is wild and so you know i, I love you know we were you know the deep learning uh crazies you know it was a decade ago and then we're a small uh, team just focusing on it for a while now everybody's that like everybody's the internet everybody's mobile everybody's ai now it's great you know and you all are seeing what we were so fascinated with for a few decades you're like this is cool stuff you know, yeah it is and so yeah i'm it's the highlight of my career that's for sure it's, it's suddenly the things you were studying that were esoteric back way back in school and like what are you doing what's this ai it's not gonna work and now it's the coolest thing and so yeah yeah i'm having so much fun harry i mean this yeah. is like and, and a lot more people like me they're all just like everybody like i don't know math you can contribute i i don't know you can ui, UI design you can help you do legal you can help it's just <laughs> all hands on deck it's just it's a wild time to be at google well, look, let's step back for a second here because, you know, listeners are like, who, who are you talking to? What, what, what's, what, oh, what, yeah. What does he do? So it's like, okay, you're the director of applied AI in the CTO's office at Google. Now, yep. you know, what does that mean? Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what kind of people are on your team? You know, what kind of projects do you work on? And, you know, I'm going to beg you to sort of slant a little life sciences in healthcare, but, but, you know, how would you answer those questions? Yeah. So, um, I love how these things start. Um, it was started, uh, 2016 as a, as a great guy, he's a special teams wizard. His name's Will Grant. It's actually, and, um, and I, I talked to him in 2016 he goes, we got this new thing we're trying to start. So well, what is it? And he said, well, um, you know, we got to talk to all these customers now, you know, and, 
and we want to build things. We don't have time to show up to talk to the customers, but we can't, we got to send in somebody who knows what they're talking about. And um, I had spent my career um, hanging out with a couple of CEOs, first at Lou Gershon at IBM when they was doing that turnaround, um, and Bob Moritz at Peter Price Warehouse when he was doing his tech transformation. And so I used to hang out with those guys and have some experience of trying to figure out how to, you know, apply the latest tech and turn a big ship, right? And yeah. they said, why don't you come to Google and help us do that? And I said, well, I want to do, do AI. Oh, that's great. You know, <laughs> and so I joined in 2016 and he goes, uh, I, I sit down ready. Like, okay, what accounts are they going to be? You know, where's he going to send me? Like, what, what do you want to be working with projects? And he sits across the table and goes, I'm glad you're here. And I said, well, thanks. And he goes, uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, you know, I like AI. And he goes, it's good. What are you going to do with it? I said, you know, I'll try to figure out how to make a difference with AI. And he goes, oh, better get started. And that's how it started. And um, I first, uh, I was trying to figure out is AI as a tool of science. That's my passion. And I wanted to, always wanted to go to the moon. And NASA's right next door. So I did a bunch of stuff at NASA. And that was fun. Um, and then 2020, I got smarter, Harry. I guess you knew it before I did. But because of COVID, we all got focused on healthcare. And I learned about next generation sequencing. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the source code to life. Right. And I was talking to people like Oxford Nanopore and people who build these things. I'm like, oh no, 16 year old kids at Harvard, they're sequencing strawberries. Mm -hmm. You're what? I mean, yeah, yeah. We're sequencing, we're reading the source code to strawberries. Now there's some errors in it because, you know, long form sequencing versus short form. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's incredible. And so I just started chasing like, could we use AI to understand health at a very, like a first principles level, kind of like the physics level? Mm -hmm. um, and people are like, oh, that's crazy. You know, how do you, you know, if you look at the technology, there's like you know, 3 billion base pairs, 2.2 billion base pairs, right? How do you understand that language? And, you know, PhDs and Nobel Prizes were simple correlations. So good gracious trying to understand that language. And I said, well, I got to start somewhere. And so that's what I do now, Harry, is I try to figure out and work with a number of top companies can you use these techniques in AI to understand the language of nature and use it to drive better health outcomes for people? Um, and so I focus a lot of that. My personal thing is on cancer because I lost my mom to cancer 20 years ago and she always wanted me to help. And um, I said, I don't know, how, you know, my brother's an oncologist. He's much smarter than I am. And I said, I'm a programmer. And now I think it's a software problem. And we're starting yeah. to see more and more evidence that if we could just understand the code and then start to debug it, could we then start to figure out what, what actions could we take to actually avoid getting sick? And that's where I've, I've been at people like V Hood, who has been focusing on this, he calls it phenomics. Um, and that's just where I spend my time now. And what I do and summarize is that, so I, I'm in Google Cloud and we're in the CTO office and we work on our largest deals. And what, I'm, what I work on is trying to figure out where can AI make a difference largely in healthcare. And so the way that works is I bring in uh, partners who really have a big problem that helps their business, helps our business, but we're really doing it to advance the science. Yeah. I mean, what you just said has been most of my career is like just trying to do those things and just having so much fun doing it. It's like, oh my goodness. Right. And you yeah. get paid to do it right on top of yeah. that, which is the yeah. best part. Yeah. And there's a, there's a commercial angle. And that, I think that's what's nice about the commercial angle is that we, we have a lot of world class research and a lot of people do like on the cover of nature over the place. And I think what I, what I focus on is, well, how do you have material impact in a commercial sense? Because the, you know, the pricing philosophy of Google is, you know, if we are pricing something for a dollar, we want to get at least $10 of value, if not more. So if we see flow, we're like, oh, you're making a difference now. Right. And so that's what we're trying to do is how do you get that flow in healthcare? And I do it, look at it particularly for AI and making a difference for, for people. And that it's great. You know, as I said, now it's the hottest thing and I'm just trying to keep up. And just learn it all and um, as much as I can and help our customers do the same thing. So when you're thinking about this or you're you're interacting with a new customer or or you're you know, you're sitting down in a meeting and they're like, you know, what does a typical conversation look like? I mean are you are you saying, yeah, we've already got something for that and you're sort of presenting it that way or you're like, hey, tell me what your problem is. And we've got this cloud set up that can help you satisfy this problem. Well, how does that, how does it, how does it go when you're, when you're in the room? Yeah. What's, what's nice about 
I mean, we're in certain hours. We're a crew, you know, a few dozen people in the CTO office, and we all have different specialties, right, and different depth. And, you know, have all been there and have built, you know, large teams and have lots of scars to prove it, right? And um, and so what, what I typically engage with, so we, we're a small team. We sit probably close to our CEO of the cloud business. And we engage with our field teams a lot, or the research teams. And it's often like they'll be working on a deal with a customer and like, does anybody know anything about omics? How do you spell it? omics? No, it's omics. Let's call there's this omics guy in the office. Let's just see if he's interested. And or, you know, we'll we're trying to get into a new area. So I have a friend of mine, Bill Fitzgerald out of Boston. And I'm all fat, I'm fascinated with the space as you are. And I'm like, we gotta get the word out. And he's like, um, all right, let's just host an event. I said, You got event money? Yeah, I got free beer. And so we went to Boston as like in May, and then um, we met a, a, an amazing people we're all learning from. I'm just sharing what I'm doing. They're sharing what they're doing. Like, wow, there's a lot of overlap. And they're like, we should do something together. And that is where our Ginkgo deal started, right? Okay. That we just announced, because we were in the area, and I'm like, I'm really fascinated in the space. They're, they're far ahead doing amazing things, and we look, we're a platform company, and they're doing a lot of uh, molecule discovery and protein discovery and great database. I'm like, oh, that's a great marriage. Let's do something cool together. Um, and so that's, that's an example. Or Mayo Clinic is another one. Or we're doing things with um, Anthem now, Elevance, you know, trying to you know, help them talk to the members. So those, that's how it starts, Harry, is really a conversation of the customer has a deep, deep problem trying to solve. And they dig around. Does anybody at Google know what this is? You know, and they go, oh, I raise my hand. And then that's where it starts, typically the C-suite. And then we have teams that then say, is there something here commercially interesting? And that turns into deals of all shapes and sizes. I'm a bi I'm a big proponent of sort of events because I I mean most of the business I've started is you get on stage you talk you meet like minded people the next thing you know you're walking out with you know projects that's historically yeah. been the way that it worked right yeah, exactly other than people. Yeah. calling people up one by one right Try yeah I'm not I'm not I'm not like one eight hundred dial omics you know hey you want, <laughs> want some omics stuff <laughs> like no I mean, it's it's just more it's more of a natural conversation typically at a very senior level. And they have hard problems that they've been working on for years. And, and sometimes a fresh pair of eyes or a new platform might be helpful. And that's what we're trying to do is like, can we be helpful? And a lot of times when we start this, we're not sure we can. Um, but that's where the CTO office comes in. It's saying, you know, can you work across multiple, multiple teams and research and see, see and pull, pull off something interesting? You know, like, we, like the thing we just did, a, a peer of mine did a great job with Wendy's, for example. You'll know, drive up and talk to a talk to an AI. Super cool. Oh, I was just reading about that. I was like, "Whoa!" And you don't even have to get the the name of the order or what you're ordering correct for the system to be able to understand what you're ordering. And I'm like, "Oh, this Isn't is that thing? this is quite yeah." We, we were at this. Yeah, I was just I was just in our team meeting, and they're talking about uh, we just had our trade show. It's called Next. And this guy was like, um, his name's Adrian. He's like, "Oh, it's great." I said, what? And he goes, well, I'm walking them through and they're used to a bot. And so customers would come up and they're like, well, oh, this is going to be just a, like, I know what bots are. I know how they are. And it, you, you talk slowly and you think, and they said, he's like, no, encourage you just talk more naturally. And he said, there's this moment when they're talking to the Wendy's drive through and they're like, oh my goodness. Right. Cause it's like, this is much different. You're like, can you add fries to that? Oh, change that, change the burger to a double and add ketchup. No problem. Like how to do that. And <laughs> That's that moment of delight. He goes, and I, I, I would end my hours because, you know, you have the man of booth, right? We're all kicking in. And he goes, I would still show up just to see that moment of delight in a customer's eye. And he goes, it's just, it's like a warm fuzzy every single time. And then, yeah, isn't I, that interesting? It's just like no, this I, delight, like, wow. That, that's why AI is now getting to the point where it is just, and we're just getting started, but it's like doing astonishing things now. So I want to say, like, I think it was 18 months ago, I sat down with, there's a robot called Moxie. And oh yeah, it, it wasn't even as sophisticated as what you're talking about. And when I was talking to it and the way that it would adapt and the way that it would ask a question and the way that it would interact, even back then I was like, oh my God, if this just gets this much better, like you, you, you would want this on your desk and just converse with it, right? Or, or just think of all the times when I, I need to call the dry cleaners or, or let's say, uh, you know, here's, you know, you, you get a bill and you, you got to call the DMV. And like, I, I got to call them. You know, I just, I'm busy. Wouldn't it be so cool just to say, I'm going to send my bot. 
you know, <laughs> and it calls and he goes, Hey, Harry, I got them on the phone. Everything's all set. There's one last question. You hop in, you hop in, you do like, that's where it's going. Like all that stuff we have to do, you know, like I got, I, I want to call my kid, but you know, she's at college, it's really hard to read her, but can you just dial every now and then just to make sure and then pick up when she's there. Right. That'd be awesome. Yeah, Just well, it's funny stuff. because the other yeah. day I was trying to make a reservation and the Google system said, would you like us to call for you? And I was thinking, yes, is that person, <laughs> is that person going to be pissed, right? Because the machine is calling. It's, 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 a, it, you got to get used to it. You got to get, I mean, you got to step into this world where everything is going to be different. But let, let me jump back here for a minute because I want to go into see, see if we can, you know, pick apart maybe an example where. Sure, sure. Um, you know. I think you 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 probably know Freenome, right? And oh, sure. if yeah. I'm not mistaken, they use Google Cloud, right, to manage I don't know, terabytes of multiomics data they get from different blood samples. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with how you guys are playing the role. Like, are they doing everything self serve? Are you guys working with them to um, get more out of your cloud storage? Your you know, your Google Kubernetes engine, you know, things like that. What, what, can you go through, and it doesn't have to be them. I'll just, I'll take any example that you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, we're like, um, we're basically, a, it's a platform play, right? You know, like, um, like a Porsche 911, right? It's like one of my favorite cars, right? Yes. But, yeah, but basically, um, you know, so you think of a platform, right? So, and these companies like the race car drivers, right? And so what we do is we have to understand, well, what kind of what kind of car do you need, right? What kind of platform do you need? And so what I'm so fascinated with, and you are, I think you are too, this whole space is biology is becoming computational. Yes. For the first time that I can remember. I mean, we had statistics for years and, and correlations and that drove all, all kinds of stuff. But now it's becoming where we can now, it's a simple idea, it's so powerful is, can't we have a computer guess a molecule and then go test it? I mean, it's called in silico. It's such a genius, simple observation, but my gosh, is that powerful? You know, imagine shrinking drug delivery times from seven years to n months, right? That's cool. And so, if you do that, now you've got you've got a lot of data, and and for years we that uh, you know as I'm learning, you'll, you'll probably teach me some more too. Is that a lot of this stuff is biomarkers, and you get mm -hmm. a blood test, you get you know some measurements. Basically, that's a that's like a spreadsheet of values, right? And we, used to, and we used to use statistics to look at correlations, like, hey, when your, your temperature is high, it, might, it means you basically might be sick, Captain Obvious, right? But there's more sophisticated versions. But now it's like, how about all these pathology slides? Oh, those are huge, right? How about the x-rays? How about the sonogram? How about, and you just keep going on and on, and you get all these different modes. And these things are, are big and fat, right? They're, there's a lot of data. We didn't have the technology to even reason with that stuff. Humans would look at it and they turn it into observations. They put it into a clinical record, they turn it into text. AI can now deal with that directly. And that's cool, right? So now if you take the X-ray, you take the healthcare record, you take the, uh, these, these different omics, you can now all reduce these things to the way that the AI reasons and ask it questions. And that And that is what these customers are doing is they're like, you know, some will say, I'm, I'm really good on pathology slides. I'll take that. I'm really good. If you look at what's happening at Genko, I'm really good on proteins. We're going to take that. But they reduce it to a space where now AI can reason with it as a tool of science. And that's the new, new. And so if you're going to do that, here's the basic thing. Let's say you got a VCF file. That comes from a, you know, it's a, a variant calling format file. That's like a billion variants. That thing is huge, right? It's gigabytes. And that's not even the fast Q file, which is, that's just a, that's Goliath, right? How do you move that thing across the internet? It takes a while. And so we have a Google is since we had to move multiple copies of the internet around, we built it on fiber. Right. And, and, and so I'm like, oh, if I got an application for you, right? We have YouTube. Imagine those billions of hours every, you know, they're, they're being served every day. Oh, that's fantastic for biology data, right? So it's, it's just, it's like a portion of a racetrack. It just, sl it just flies through the network. And that's the kind of things that they use it for saying, your network's fantastic. You're built for large data. You've got a computational engine. You now have a tensor stack with tensor processing units because that's what these things are is tensors. He goes, I want in. And that's that's why I'm seeing a lot of these companies use it saying you can, you can always use VMs and other things, but we've been doing tensors with consumers for what, 20 years? 
and I'd say I'd actually more like 12 years, I would say. I mean, we've been looking at analyzing consumers for that many, that long. Two trillion times a, a year doing the searches, that's all tensor math now. And we can now use it for biology. And so yeah. what we're doing, what we're doing at cloud is like, how do you enable that as fast as you can? And, and we learn from them saying, what kind of pipelines do you need? What kind of data are you moving around? What's it look like? You know, because you know, it, these are big lumpy pieces of data you've got to analyze. And that's where the platform for that. Well, I, I mean, but, but you know, this, cause you know, we, we built something internally ourselves, like, you know, actually train a transformer from the ground up for a particular application. Cool. I mean, this is not falling off a log, right? I mean, if you really <laughs> no, want to get something not, out of this, not. right? Like somebody's really got to know what they're doing. I mean, I can tell you, like we were trying to get something out of it and we, and we, we had it focus on one body of, of knowledge and, you know, what we got out of it was just uh, honestly sounded like a bunch of CEOs talking about their companies, right? To a certain degree, because we mm -hmm. were focused on an area of finance. We're like, no, mm -hmm. no, no. We need to get a broader set of data because because this thing is not, it, it does what you tell it to do, but it's, you know, and even then you, you, you this is not falling off a log just yet. Um, not yet, but I think it, it's going to be right for a lot of the common cases. And what I love about, um, you know, sitting in a hyperscale and where we see is I see hundred, I see the patterns for hundreds, if not thousands of customers. Right. Right. And boy, is it, is it iterating quickly and some, uh, and some interesting things to still out of that. Like everyone's doing document summarization. It's the hottest thing, you know, cause yeah. like, and here's the pain point. I don't have time to read all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you just summarize it? He said, we're supposed to read it all. Well, you know, I don't read it all. What I do know is I, I, I do a triage. I scan and then I read the things I really need to know for a case. I'll deal with that. But the green light stuff, let it fly through. That, that pain point is everywhere in business, right? And so we're like, okay, let's make that easy. Let's make that super easy, right? So how do you take a model and basically train it on a document core? How do you make search to search across these documents? Two clicks in five minutes. Mayo Clinic did it. All right. That, that kind of, right. So, so now is it for every person? Is it spe every special AI? No, 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 no. You'll still have that. But the idea is that how do you make it as easy as search? Right. And so you're doing prompt engineering and everything else, but are there common t tasks you're trying to do? Like I want to generate a document from a corpa, but basically I've got some special documents. I want to summarize it, right. Or I need to find something in there. We'll make that super easy. And so we're just learning from you and everyone else. What do you need? And then we put people together who just like make it easy. And that's hard. That is really hard. It's so much easier to ship a product with a thousand features. Right. Ship the one with three, which three, that's the hard part. Right. But, but it's, but it's interesting, right? You say that, but I think it's gotten, okay. Again, this is maybe not everybody, but mm -hmm. it's gotten easy enough. And it's hell gotten cheap enough, depending on what it is you're trying to do, right? If you're not going to train a transformer from the ground up, okay, that that may, that's harder. But if you're going to fine tune yeah. a data set or, um, you know, do some of the things that you're talking about, I'm on a chat group with like I don't know a thousand CEOs where everybody's coming up. That's with, awesome. You know, what do they need to do, right? And these CEOs who are not tech guys, right, are getting things done and implementing them and pushing it through their own organization in, you know, uh, I, I'm sure you've, you've heard the term FAFO. Day, yeah. yeah. Right. And I I'll say fool around and find out for the show, but you know, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, the yeah, actual yeah. term, right. Yeah. And, and that's what they're doing. And it's like, well, how much did that cost you to just play with it and sort of get it far enough along? I, uh, you know, hundred bucks, 200 bucks, 500 bucks, right. It's not, Fifty thousand dollars, right? To isn't that to amazing? Run something to see. I love that. I mean, I, I'm getting so many meetings now where the senior executives, she's just come off just using the bot at night, right? Or using it between lunch, and they have direct experience with these things. And it, it just, you know, I love seeing it because I've been doing it for years. Now, now everyone's seeing the same stuff that used to get me all excited. And and what we're doing, I mean, I guess the question is. How do you make that easy for them? Or what, what was the question about, you know, trying to, you know, for, for them, for the ado adoption? Yeah. So I think it's, what we're, we're seeing is, um, I, I had this adage, you got to think about it as the uh, AI mullet, which is 
business in front, AI party in the back, right? So, because you know, it's business in front, party in the back. So the idea is that you need to focus because it's so excited. You get so easy to, to play with the technology, get excited about it, right? Because it's, 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 it's remarkable. Like when you first see the browser, right? It's that, it's that cool. But then they're trying to figure out like, where do I use this thing, right? And how do I use this to make my people smarter, to make my, my business more efficient, to make my, the quality of life of my company better, my, my customers better? How do I use that? Um, and we're finding that, you know, we call it like duet, but bringing AI as an assistant to a workflow seems to be predominant. And especially with workflows that generate documents and read documents, right? Everybody has that. And that's like a huge chunk of healthcare, right? The science piece is interesting, but a lot of, I mean, but the money is in the boring billions of pajama time, right? It's like, yes, I don't, claims data, you know, uh, submitting that. requests, get it. Yes, that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that's the money because it's, it, it's a pain, right? And that, and I think that's where everyone's going to use it first. It's you know, simple. It's like using, you know, using docs, it just sorts to help you generate, but it's like making that more specific for your workflow. There's hundreds of those today. And then we're also seeing more advanced science of like, wait a second, I can use this like playing the game of Go. You know, my friends at NASA call it an idiot savant. I said, what do you mean by that? They said, well, Scott, if we're using AI, it's amazing what it generates, but we want, we like anything else, a new idea, we want to test it with the tried and true methods we've done for decades, but we'll take the idea. Yeah. Right. That's cool. Right. So think of it this way. It generates something for you. Harry, and then you'll use that, but you'll add your own insights to say, this is from Harry, right? It just makes it so much easier for you to produce that. And we're seeing that a lot in professionals in science and, and business today. Well, I was trying to explain it to someone the other day. I'm like, this is the first time where you can actually have a sparring partner. Where oh, yeah. you can play questions. Yeah. And, yes, you can go back and forth with this thing. I mean, you got to prompt it the right way to get you know, the right back and forth, but you don't have to just look at a blank wall anymore. Like you can actually do a few iterations to flush a few of your own ideas out and move things forward, um, which is really cool. Now, once it's conversational, I think that will be a, a whole other level that, that yeah. will, you know. And that's, uh, I think every, every, everyone's going to have their own assistant in a very short period of time it's going to be i think it's going to astonish all of us how fast it's going to how it's going to come and it's the kind of thing where you know as your programmer today the old adage if you can't do it in five minutes you better google for it you need to, you typically do a stack overflow and then we used to say good programmers copy great programmers paste right and what we're finding now though is that we all google and we grew up doing that the next generation they're going to have this ai they're asked questions you get instant answers with better information than any of us have. It will generate answers that'll, that'll assist us in our processes better than anybody ever before. And that's gonna be for everybody, age six up. I mean, think of that. And then that's, and now the question is, what questions do you ask? And that has been the, the, the hallmark of genius for centuries is knowing what question to ask. Because you'll get but here's the interesting part, right? When you talk to people about, or when I talk to people about this, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you talk more than one shock value above where they are, or where there are, like the, I can already see, like the the eyes roll back, like the glaze shows up. They they're like, I have no idea what I'm talking about, or or they think it's, I don't know, simplistic in some way, right? If they just grasping the impact of what's coming and how quickly it's coming, how, mm -hmm. how quickly it is improving. I'm not seeing a lot of people grasp what's going on. Well, it's, it, it's a minority. I, I think so, but it's, it's, um, I mean, the internet progressed pretty quickly and, you know, third over 30, you know, 30 years ago. Um, but now we're all connected. We all have supercomputers in our hands, most people, you know, these, these iPhones or Androids, right? Um, and so the word spreads so much faster than when the internet came out. And this is much more powerful than that. And you're seeing, we're seeing it now where these, these language models, they're starting to approximate what um, some neuroscientists know is called the human language function. 
And this thing doesn't exist. But the idea is you can imagine us as a function, which is given some utterance, some music that you hear, smoke signals, some math you see. If that's the input to your function, the output is, well, what's the most probabilistically correct best answer to follow that? And in the conversations, yeah. what, would you, what would you say next to be a good conversation in different cost functions? I'm like, well, that's cool. I think as a community, we're getting close and we feel it, we can taste it to approximating that. And if we get a good approximation for that, oh my goodness, we're going to have a tool that essentially is this amazing neocortex for everybody that has more information than all of us. And everybody's going to have access to it for pennies. That's amazing. I, that, I feel that, like that, depending on the application, we're already there. Um, and there's probably people working on it right now that would, you know, depending on how narrow on the, the application on, yeah, is. Yeah, the whole thing is narrow the domain is going to feel that way. But I think it has yes. a general purpose. And that's what's coming here. Um, I, I was listening to a, um, a podcast and uh, um, of Lex Friedman had Manos Kellis on. And he, he said, um, AI is not a tool. Okay. And I was like, what? No, AI is a tool. No. You follow it says, no, it's a partner. Now, that, that was really interesting. And I think it's what you're saying too, Harry, which is like you collaborate with these things. And it, it and if you take the, the NASA approach of an idiot savant, it's a fantastic, brilliant you know, creator of ideas and of, of content that you can then use to accelerate yourself so much more than everybody you, know, you ever had before. You know, typewriter was amazing when I was in college. That was amazing. I have to, I have to handwrite this stuff. And then he had things that would generate it. That's really cool. Now the actual content itself, you can you can write books in a weekend. You know, yeah, and there's it, people already doing it, right? So, so you the outline. So let's say you know a topic really well, and you know, truth be known, I'm, I'm helping write a book on Gen AI. Well, guess how we're going to do that? Well, I have the outline. I know the facts I want to do, and my chapters do like in the twentieth, and the editor is all over me. Where's it doing? I'm not worried. He's like, what? He said, I'm forcing myself to use AI for this, Harry, because I want to give myself like a day. And that used to take me like a couple months. And I know the content. I know what I need to do. But I did a, I did a book over a weekend. And that's not that great. But I did my first one. Like, oh, this is so doable. Because I think that's where it's headed, Harry, where now it's like, how's your homework today? Uh, Nancy, as your daughter comes in. She's in seventh grade. Not too much, Dad. What do you have to do? I have two 20-page papers. I've got a pictorial essay. And then I've got to do a three-minute video. How long did it take you? I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? And then they're going to go in. The teachers, the teachers, they're going to use AIs to judge it. And they're going to have questions and answers around the content. And then the question is not the, the thesis format because it's going to be perfect. It's not like the pixel perfect that you get. It's like, why did you choose that topic? Why did you choose those questions? And right. It's a much deeper conversation than you have a, you have, you're missing a comma here at minus one. Like that, we're so beyond that. But now it's like, imagine the conversation in seventh grade with your daughter is like thinking about why she thought that way. Why is she perceiving this? Why is she guided that way? So cool. Such a different individuals, like the people that have got to teach this, the people that have got to understand how to implement this. I mean, and even some of the stuff you brought up from a philosophical perspective, like just having these conversations. I, my biggest worry is I'm not hearing enough people have these conversations and it's like, the locomotive is coming and it's coming, you know, orders of magnitude faster than I think most people expect. I, because I we're all connected. We're all connected. Yeah, no, yeah. we can't. It's, it's a hundred a day. And we're all like the ML researchers think they're, they're chasing this human language function. It's like chasing space flight. It feels like Sputnik. <laughs> it really does. And I think it's going to come so much faster than we all expect. Um, and some of my favorite programmers in the world are now spending full time on this. You know, John Carmack created it. He's all over this. George Hotz is all over this. Um, we see it, it's coming when, I don't know, I, you know, product managers, like, you know, we're trying to turn into, to, for planning three-year plan. They're like, I don't know what I'm going to ship in six months. You know, we it's used, that fast. We used to do five-year plans and I already thought that was way out there. I oh mean, my God. How do you do a five-year plan in AI? I don't know. <laughs> we, I can see direction where, where it's going. Um, but I think what we're finding is pragmatically today, Harry, they're looking at like, what's a pain in the neck? Like, where are we doing administrative stuff that we could just use AI to just to like a hot, hot knife through butter, melt through it, right? Where, where do we do the things where I don't, I want to call my customer back, but I can't reach them. I, I don't have enough time in the day, right? I want to be able to answer their questions instantly, not put them on, not, not let them wait, right? I, I want to have a great drive-through experience, even if the kids get sick or it's snowy, 
and icy. See what I'm saying? All those missing things, AI can come in. It starts to take that pain out of business. And, I mean, it's funny. I've got to give a talk in three or four weeks to a group of physicians on 15 minutes uh, around AI. And I'm like, uh, my, you know, on, on one hand, I'm like, I should go through like 15 examples in 15 minutes just to give them an idea of the breath or do you pick like two or three? But they, I, I feel like a month from now, there's going to be a whole bunch of brand new examples to bring to them as opposed to what was a month ago. Yeah. It, I, and as soon as Doug, so I'm on this, um, there's a new uh, journal uh, called um, AI and Precision Oncology run by an oncologist, Doug Flora. My brother's on it. Your brother called me, goes, Hey, we're doing this thing at AI on ecology. You want to help? I'm like, well, sure. You know, and now they're putting me to work. Um, but what's interesting is um, what we're finding is so I went to one of their annual conferences, you know, American uh, AC, ACCC. Uh, it's basically community cancer centers. And we're all sitting around uh, or attend, standing around the area. And I started talking and saying, Well, what's the, uh, I guess my brother asked this, what's the number one technology in the last 10 years that's really changed cancer care? I'm thinking, oh, it's next generation sequencing. It's like, you know, man, man new treatments. It's, you know, CAR, CAR T therapy. And they're like, oh, no, without a doubt, video conferencing. Like, wow, I didn't see that one coming. I said, what? No, no. Cause I can, I can, I can, I can zoom when I'm, I can't, I can't make it in. I can, I can hang, I can do a Google meet with my customer and with my patient who has a, has a question immediately. And I can do it from my house when, it's, when the weather's bad. It's changed my practice more than anything else. I was like, wow. I didn't see really? that coming. And then, yeah. Oh. And it's like that. And then I said, what? So just their, their daily practice. These are, these are practicing oncologists. And then, and they're all excited about short form video too. And I'm like, now that's interesting. Why? And they said, I have 70 patients a day, Scott. And she runs, you know, cancer in a, in a remote state. On my way to get a sandwich out of the machine, I have two minutes. I use it to find new information about, you know, the, the, like a share and, I, and a market. And there's a guy called OncDoc. He's got almost a million followers now. Uh, Sanjay Janeja, he's a great doctor. They use that to share among themselves best practices. That's cool. And so, and then they said, now here's what, here's what I want to help with. I said, so, we're, so we've got video. That's, that's great. I'm like, wow. It's so like the internet, no video. And they said, the next thing we need help with is like pajama time. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Now these are like top on college's world. And, and they're like, Scott, I love my patients. I care for them deeply. And that at, when I come home, I have dinner with my family. And then afterwards, I pull out the patients for the next day and I do charting. Yeah. I'm in my pajamas and I typically have a cup of coffee there or, you know, if I have stay, if I guess, you know, and I'm trying to figure out the plan for the next day. And I have to enter the stuff administratively so we can inform everybody. I can fly through that with an AI that can help me summarize quickly and, and basically provide rough drafts that I can refine. That's what I want to do. And that's the summarization thing I talked about. So it's really this thing about the practice of oncology. If you're a brilliant oncologist and everything else, like what makes your daily life easier? Well, I can connect with my patients by remotely. So they have a question I can immediately, so they don't have to worry, I don't have to worry about scheduling. They love that. And two, how do I start to document this to make so much better? And that's what I'm finding is like the onus of a lot of these cares is like, how do you help the, the practitioner? And then there's even more sophisticated things coming in cancer research. Now, physician scientists will give me a different answer. The practicing oncologist, it was like the daily practice. Well, it's funny because like, you know, I'm always thinking about how do we use this technology to, you know, diagnose and then determine a therapeutic approach, you know, some therapeutic approach better, right? I mean, the, mm -hmm. my brain goes there. Now. Well, we all do. Honestly, yeah, it AI has for years. You know, pushing buttons on, a, you know, to, to enter the data into the system, right? Although I know that's the pain point, it's definitely not the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about this space. No, think of AI. When I, when I went to MIT many years ago, um, you know, Mycin, dating myself, we did rule-based systems and everybody's fascinated with AI as a diagnostician, the, the AI yeah. doctor, as since the dawn of AI in the 60s. It's really it doesn't go very far because I, I talked to a doctor and, and she goes, uh, well, there you go again, Scott. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I don't need a diagnostician. I don't need help. I'm like, but that's, you see the cover of nature. You see this. She goes, that's for interesting science. It's cool, but not for practice. I said, well, what do you need? She goes, just help me get the data. I said, what do you mean? She goes, when I sit down, I've got to go through multiple systems. I need the records. I've got different tests. 
I'm, I'm doing different interfaces. Can you just be smart, pull it together, present it to me, summarize it to me, and let, the, let me make the decision? Now, you might say, this looks like pneumonia. I'll take that as a consideration, but it's my, I've been doing this for 20 years, so say as a GI, I can do this in my sleep, most basic things. And if I right. can't, I have a consult with experts to figure it out. I don't need an AI there. We do need AI to gather the data, paper the data, and help us with the business side of the business. Huge help. I'm like, wow. So I think this is the dichotomy where AI for years, and it will continue to, because it's so fascinating. Can we understand our, our, the, the source code life, what's happening? Like I have some friends in India, it's like a company called Apollo 365, where they're going to do that kind of thing. Where in India, some care is better than no care. And they're happy to have an AI make suggestions of, sort of common ailments. Right. Um, that, that's much harder in the Western world because there's a chain of liability that doesn't exist in India, right? For when it goes wrong. Um, so I think that I think we will see that over time. But I think in the next three to five years, most of that's just going to be allowing doctors to spend more time with their patients and getting patients the answers to take the agenda out of the system. I mean, that would, that would be, that would be fantastic. But I do believe like once you get this information in, in one place, right. Mm -hmm. That next step of what could it be? And what would I do if it's this, that, you know, it brings it together a lot faster. Oh yeah. And, and that's just like, imagine empowering them with an assistant. So the assistant sits there and she, you know, this doc, this GI has a, has a complex case. There's all kinds of tests, everything else. And she sees the patient. She's got a couple minutes to do charting. That's how it works, right? Seven minute visit, three minutes to chart. And the assistant comes in and goes, very tightly organized. Here's a summary. Here's the last test. Here's what I've seen before. Here's relevant research. Okay, doc, here's the information for the patient. Here's it all. All the data is there. You can click it. I just summarized it for you in the way that you like to get it summarized with references. She's like, thank you. And she can take that do the diagnostic and the AI can say, you know, maybe suggest, you know, some maybe refinements and say, would like me to write that up for the chart for you? No problem. So just, and I, you know, I don't, I, I assume AI didn't help with any of these other books that you've written in the past back then, but you've, you've, you've written a book called Unhealthcare and I believe another one called The 42 Genes, um, which actually came out in May of this year, if I'm correct. Um, what was the first one about and what was the second one about for everybody that's listening? Yeah. So the 42 genes was a weekend experiment. And what I wanted to do is say, could, is this possible? Cause I, I saw some people online that said, I wrote a book the weekend, like really let's try that. And so what I was, what I've been studying lately is trying to understand the source code of life. And I was looking for the FDA and other ones like what genes are most studied and what genes are used for cancer, for um, for healthcare, for your fitness, for skin, that sort of thing. So, and I found a subset of them, of 42, and all the research was pretty, comp you know, pretty comprehensive and complex. I said, I want to make this like in an eighth to 10th grade level. And can I find 42? Cause that's the answer to life in the universe. So let's pick, let's pick 42. And can we write a summary of what these genes are as just like quick little handy reference manual? Could I do that in two days from a standing start and publish it on Amazon? using kindle i'm like wow well, and i've never used kindle before i never used other other tools and i said let's go and it was two long days and i barely made it at like nine o'clock at night i got the darn thing out now you can you can download it it's i don't know i had to price it at something so i'm wondering how all that works but it was interesting to me that i learned a lot and like oh this is powerful this is super powerful um, now, is it a great book? I, it's an okay book. I think it's more about the, the, going through that and saying, what, what's interesting? Now, I've been using that and studying a lot since then. But now you're going to see when we have a Gen AI book coming out, um, and Antonio Gulli is uh, editing this. A lot of Googlers and others are helping him. I'm doing a chapter on the enterprise search. That chapter will be largely co-written with an AI. And I'm going to use Duet to write it. And I'm like I did at MIT, I'm forcing myself to do it in a very short period of time. And the, and the bar of quality is much higher. That was just me kind of do something that's not embarrassing to ship on as just a book. But this is like peer reviewed. And I'll find out. And I have, I'm getting high confidence that we're going to pull this off. Now, my editor is all over me. He's like, where's the draft? Right, <laughs> but, right. But, but I, I think it, it's, it's very meta. If you're writing a book on Gen AI, you should use Gen AI with your smarts to, to write the chapters. Right. I'm... <sighs> What did you have to do special 
if anything, when you were, I'm assuming there's a whole body of literature that you had to somehow have the system absorb and then help you summarize for the book, or at least give you the, the yeah, high so, points. So, so the nice thing about being in the C2 office, we get access to things before they ship, right? So I had access to early tools, so that's kind of cool. Is that cheating a little? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but I use those tools. You know, I used to have 2,000 GPUs of my own. I don't have them anymore, by the way. They were taken away. <laughs> um, but uh, I was using those, and what I was doing is I had been studying this to try to understand the source code life for about two years, and I'd assembled a list of my favorite genes. I just, I just kept looking at these things, like the COMT gene. That's pretty interesting. Um, the ACT3, uh, there's another gene that's like called the warrior or the warrior gene, right? There's genes that look at, hey, how's the cilantro taste, right? Um, and I just fascinated how, how that all works. And other genes, like um, there's one gene called DPYD. Never heard of it. Well, if you don't know you have a particular variant, and if you take a medicine, it can be lethal. And I met a woman whose husband died because he had this variant. And he didn't know the test and he passed away and through the lawsuit she's now trying to change that it's called pharmacogenomics yeah um i have a i, have a, I, have a, I personally have something called factor five which is a, a blood clotting thing and for years is and i was six do you have the same thing yeah so when i was six they said oh he says croup when i was a teenager oh he has recurrent pneumonia and i'm like what no it wasn't when, when i finally landed in some place in chicago in um in Colorado, they, they did a test like, oh my God, you got factor five. I was clotting for 20 years, right? And I'm like, this, I never want people to go through this, right? So I started studying like where these things come from. And that's where the genes, so I had already assembled all these documents. And I'm like, what the heck? I fed these things to the AI. And then I it would ask questions, it would give me detailed scientific explanations. I figured out the prompts to give me something that's shorter. And I would and I would do the right and I finally just iterated and this is the collaboration to build a chapter. Then I said prompts that work and I started to replicate for the genes. That's how I got the 42 done. And I was just literally grinding through all that research. And that comes from PubMed, from you know, online medical journals, everything else. And what you see in that is a distillation at a 10th grade level. That's what I chose. Um, of that using an AI, I think it's pretty good. And I'm like, now that's cool. So when I go talk to customers, like you ever did, you know, you just did anything said, have you seen my research? It's like this pile like this, right? And I've gone through that task. So now I know, all right, I have some experience with this that I can share with others. Do you know how many times I've had to iterate in my book because my wife said, it's too high level. you got to bring it down. And I'm like, what do you mean bring it down? I don't know how to bring it down more than this. And you go back and you, you know, you rewrite and you rewrite. I mean, if I could have fed that to something and had it make the language more accessible, oh my God, it would have saved me six months at least. Oh, easily. A lot of time. And so that, so that was an exercise in just, you know, have you actually run a race? You know, could you do this over a weekend? You know, I, I recommend if you have an idea you want to get out, you should do it. It's just fun. Um, but I find now, Harry, is that those tools, now they were very early. They didn't have all the polish of you know, tools that ship with the pretty UI. I mean, I was using command line stuff, right? Um, but that alone was enough to pull this off. And I'm like, oh, this is good. This is really good. And now I think everyone's going to have that. And so these tasks we have of writing, writing the cubit, you know, qu your quarterly, quarterly business review, writing your weekly summary, um, writing long letters to get admitted to a school uh, to justify an expense. Ah, that's all going to be co-authored with AI, like this year. Yeah, I mean, so I, I want to go back to healthcare, but I got to ask. Yeah, we like, can, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I just believe that this is happening so fast that first of all, humans are not designed to adapt that quickly, uh, but what happens to people's jobs? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure that there's going to be like a bunch of cuts quickly until the system figures out what else people can do. Right. I mean, that, that's, that's what I sort of see happening in some of the companies that I, you know, I have, you know, friends running or people that I know that are doing, it's like, oh, yeah. I can take customer service down to a third of what it, what it is, you know, today. Because it's more well, efficient. Well, I think, you know, um, jury's still out how that's going to happen. I mean, there's no question 
uh, the, the, the nature of work will change. And it's, and it's gonna, I think it could be a beautiful thing. I mean, it's much like uh, a few hundred years ago, you know, I wasn't alive, but I've read the books, right? I mean, most of us, and there's only not even a billion of us on the planet, right, eight billion now, uh, several hundred million of us would spend our whole day taking care of food, right? Yeah. We would build, you know, plants, vegetables, livestock, everything else. We take care of food and we're going to eat it and go back to sleep. Or then we do some other things to then go raise money for equipment to do that and bartering. That was an agrarian lifestyle for many years. Thank goodness I don't have to wake up every day and go, you know, I, I have amazing produce in California. I don't have to grow it all, right? right. I just go to a store. I can order it on, Insta on Instacart. What am I doing with all that spare time? You know, if you're not taking care of the farm, what are you going to do now? That you don't have a job to do, go take, go slop the pigs. I'm like, oh, there's so much more I can do now. <laughs> and, and so will we all be doing slopping the pigs? No, I think a lot of that job will be taken away from AI, the, you know, the, the, the equivalent of that. But there'll be so many new jobs and so much more higher level, powerful jobs than we can even imagine today. Um, and that that is going to be, I think, a, like a renaissance period for the human race in terms of the creativity. Because now everyone's going to have access to it. And I think, that, I think that we're just, we get nervous about what, but I know how to take care of my food. That's what I've been doing for my whole life. Oh, oh there's all, there's so much more ahead and it's, it's going to be exciting. But if you're latching onto, I'm really good at you know, like digging a row for my corn. Yeah. You, you got to learn something new. Right? right. Right. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a bumpy transition. Let's put it that way. Um, until we figure out what's next o only because it's just moving so fast. And I just don't think people are designed to absorb that level of, or speed of change. Yeah, uh, I mean, and we still have, I mean, the tool is going to iterate rapidly and just get even more powerful, uh, much like the internet did or mobile did. Um, and then we're, we're, we're as humans figuring, well, how, do, how does this really change your daily life? I mean, it's just until you get there and you, you know, I encourage Anyone watching this to figure out, well, I don't use it every day. Find something. <laughs> Seriously. Think of a side hustle. Think of a project. You know, like I, I wrote a little book on 42 Genes. Why? Did the world need that? No. But I said, how do I do this? Right? Or, you know, help my, I help out for, you know, Onco AI, which is this, uh, you know, it, it's basically some oncologists I work with on AI for cancer. Um, same thing with Lust Garden Foundation. So I help a lot of that. And I use AI every day now for two, three hours. And yeah. I couldn't do the, the load of work I'm doing without it. I mean, and it's funny really, because I've yeah. been, I've been taking this class, you know, a few classes that, um, you know, eight hours straight where we're sitting in a room Oof. playing with every tool, right? Oh, playing. Every that's tool that's yeah. out there and, and just, you know, going through different examples and different CEOs in the room will want to see it work in a different way. And because if you don't lock yourself in the room to do it, you're never going to have time to just. Yeah. You don't want to be that executive that said, I remember this many years ago. Hey, I heard about the internet. Can you download that and print out the website and send it to me as an attachment? <laughs> I was just like, I was, I was 26. I'm like, what, what in the world? <laughs> and you know, that's when email was new. Right. And so you don't want to be that person. Right. What you want to do is say, no, I used it last night. What are you using it for? Oh, you know, we have a, we threw a, um, a there's a, a party for our block every, you know, every fall around Hall uh, Halloween. I threw a party. So I, I wrote the thank you letters using an AI, right? I, I generated the images for the website using an AI. I use MidJourney and I use stuff on, on Google. I use that. And then um, I'm, I'm, my email, I'm using the AI to help me write my emails for me. Like, there you go. Right. So the point is like, pick a project you don't have time for and force yourself. And then, then I'll say, this is pretty cool. And that's how we're going to so, learn. I was looking at your LinkedIn bio and you're obviously pretty enthusiastic about tensors. Like. <laughs> it's my license plate. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you had to explain to a non-expert who, who might be listening to this show, you know, like, like my father-in-law or somebody, right, is. How do you explain to them what a tensor is and how do tensors make machine learning models work? Yeah. So, um, so the, the physics folks on the phone are, are, are listening to this. Um, they may, uh, 
combat me in some of this, but basically if, if you look at a tensor, a tensor is how AI represents a concept in the world, okay? Read this book called A Thousand Brains Theory. And in there, if you look inside your head, inside our brains in the neocortex, the gray matter at the top, it's all chemicals and electrical activations, these things called neurons, right? And so imagine if I were to take a spreadsheet and I, I, I say, hey, hey, Harry, one second, freeze. Okay, great. You're frozen. Now I'm going I'm to take a spreadsheet out. I'm going to write down the charge level for every single neuron in your brain for that split second. Zero, it's off, not thinking. One, it's charged. And, and some variation in between that's gray, right? I'm going to get a few, you know, a few hundred billion numbers, right? That's a tensor. Now I, I, I say something else. Those are going to fluctuate rapidly over time. That's just the concepts flow through your brain. Mm -hmm. And so in some respect, it's a mental model I have for AI, which is we're a tensor processing machine. We take modalities into our brains, much like the thousand brains theory. We turn that into these activation levels of our neurons. We reason, and that goes back out into utterances or actions we take. And if you look how AI works, it's much simpler than that. It's not as beautiful as that, not as complex, but it's effective. So they represent words now as just a tensor, which is much smaller. It's not 100 billion. It's maybe 768 numbers wide. It represents the activation of 768. The image, the same thing. It's a little square, right? Audio, the same thing. And so a concept inside a model is just like when you say Bill Clinton, that, that'll activate something in the model. The weights and how they're set and basically the activation levels, that's a tensor. Isn't that cool? And so that's what tensor. So basically tensor is how you represent it. And I'm saying the biggest shift we're going to see for me and enterprises is we, we now have SQL databases, no SQL databases and docs largely, right? And SharePoint, everything else. That's how the enterprise represents stuff. I think most of that's going to be tensors in 10 years, right? And it's a much more sophisticated, more capable way to represent and reason about the world. Yeah, I, I, part of me, well, I think it depends on the company, but I think some of them are going to move much faster than 10 oh, years. seems like a lifetime. <laughs> I know, but the AI startups are doing it now. I mean, and what I find in these new startups, they're using, like I am for my side projects, we all have them. They're, they're using AI in every process. Yes. It's amazing. Yes. Every process. There, there's like three kids, kids, they're younger than me, but basically yeah, I know. like everything they do is AI first compared to the way that I would think about approaching the problem. And I mean, one of, one of the companies I know, they're buying a company, not for the product, but for the customer service system that they designed internally that's completely AI first. They think it's gonna completely revolutionize the way they do their own customer support. Oh yeah. And that's what I love about these startups that be, they have no resources by design. Right. And that's, think of this, like when, when I did the little 42 genes book, I had no resources by design. Right. I had, I had to do a book on a weekend. And if you do that project, like, how do I do this? You, you have to reach out to other tools. Right. Otherwise it's just not humanly possible. And so I think they're learning so much by just saying, I've got to do marketing, I got to do sales, I got to do customer support, I've got to do HR, I've got to do employee reviews, I've got to do OKRs, I got to do board reports, AI, 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 through the whole thing. Well, otherwise you couldn't, I, I mean, you know, my consulting firm, I would honestly say that if we had all these tools that I have today, I wouldn't have needed to hire 40% of the people that I hired. Well, think about what great consultants do, right? Is that they say, okay, what are the questions you want to ask? Let me go get the let me go to get the temperature of the world's best. I'll get you the best opinions of a thousand people or 500 people. You do a sample, you sit down with them and do an interview. Oh, you can imagine doing all that in one day with one person. Well, I told you that system that we put together that, you know, reads all the scientific papers. I mean, before I always said not exhaustive, right? On every slide, not exhaustive, because it was impossible to be exhaustive. Now you can use these systems to say, look, we've looked at every paper in this category, this is what's going on. Right. I mean, it's think of a, totally think of it does for like, Yeah, think of it does for like for management, what it does for governance, right? When you have the ability to go ask a thousand people and get an answer and synthesize it and summarize it, 
and have a conversation with a thousand people in parallel, if you mandate it, right? A scheduling might probably take you 30 days just to land all the meetings. Um, but you can all do it with AI now. Amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, the power of this thing, these things, and what's coming, I, I just believe like there's work as we know it, science as we approach it, governments, the way that we run the economy, it, there's, there's, there's a profound shift coming. It, it just has to. It just cannot stay the way that it is. Yeah, I think it, you're right, It's Harry. just impossible. It, it's going to be like, you know, most people, a, a lot of people alive today don't know the world before the internet, right? A lot of people do. I find that interesting. A lot of people don't know the world before electricity. And so that's how profound, I think you're right, is that it's going to be so pervasive and everywhere and, and really lift a lot of us up. I think we're, it'll be like so pervasive and helpful for so many people. The, the only difference between all those other things in my mind is they were fundamental tools. Like you needed a human to do something, push a button, flip a switch, something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is not that. This is so far, be this is, you know, I can set up the AI, have it communicate with Zapier. Zapier goes and does something. I, I mean, I could have it do an entire process and set it up to do it in an automated way. Like no, no human needed in this process that's a different profoundly different dynamic than i think than any of these other innovations we've had before yeah you sound like henry ford right in other words how do you do how do you make a manufacturing line use tools to do jobs that you know you've done by hand and i think a lot of the back office stuff we're doing is going to be done exactly that way harry i think you're right it's amazing so so when you look at life sciences landscape right now, right? And, and you're, you, I'm sure you guys are talking to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see, I mean, where are the places where you're seeing AI and other forms of computing sort of have the most profound effect on healthcare and drug development? I mean, what, what, what are the things that sort of make you pessimistic and what are the things that say make you optimistic? Let's focus on the, uh, I guess the optimistic side. Um, so we've talked about, you know, the administrative side. You know, there's a lot of uh, paperwork that's good to basically make sure there's an audit trail and you know to document the process. It's just a good scientific method, right? Um, there's a lot of write-ups that need to get done. So AI is going to help with that for no, absolutely, right? That submitting to the FDA, doing the FDA reviews, that's all going to be assisted by AI. Um, same with documented clinical trials, all that. Um, I think the more interesting science piece that gets to like the Nature Magazine level of things, right? We start to see this, Scientific American, um, you know, New England Journal of Medicine, that sort of stuff. Where that's happening, I'm seeing a lot of effort and they're all doing it, which is a simple observation. If I could use an AI to help me pick a molecule, could that dramatically shorten my time to explore which molecules are the right ones to ship for this particular antigen or whatnot. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. In other words, or could, a, could an AI suggest targets, which are basically what part of a metabolic process do you want to do to basically help someone through a, a bad condition, right? Could it suggest a target that it reduces my search space, right? Um, and then can I, if I run the tests in parallel, can I have it then highlight for me which tests I should look at first, right? And so we're, what they're using it is, they call it in silico. So can I start to take processes that I now do in vitro or in the lab and use AI to reduce the search space to dramatically reduce the time it takes to, to find the, the cure, if you will. Mm -hmm. Everyone's thinking about that. And then, um, so that's like in silico versus in vitro. And there's a loop. So, so like they're doing it like NASA. In silico, good suggestion. Let me test it. And then you do in vitro. Oh, this is pretty cool, right? And then and it then feeds the in silico. And then and it that, keeps and that just and then what happens that get makes in silico that much smarter. And now if you do enough of these things, in silico starts to build a neural representation, the tensors we talked about, for molecules, for patients, everything else. Now it's like, okay, I don't take it to trial. Let me run it by these million, you know, uh, profiles I've created of different profiles I've seen from the clinical trials of the past. Okay, this is the type of profile we should test first. That's amazing. So now when you go out for the clinical trial, you'd be more specific. Here's what I really want to test because I've tested everything else seems okay. Now I validate that with a generic test, 
But here's what I want for my trial. And it's the idea is that who do you want the clinical trial? The 10 right people. Right? Right. So who are the right people? I don't know. So do a much larger trial. Right? AI is helping there. So I think it's that, that the observation is one, help with the paperwork, number one. Um, when that goes aside, that's like, that's the going from agrarian to industrial society. Just help me write all that stuff and review it. Second one is I want to do in silico plus in vitro and make that really tight. And that's, that's very much like the ginkgo deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that we're doing. We were, and so they're all thinking about that. How do I use AI to really understand what's going on? It's, it's really fat. And then the next thing is, you know, Leo will talk about digital twins. For years, digital twins for humans were based off of markers, right? Right. Um, now we can do a much more sophisticated one um, to basically say, because imagine if the digital twin goes, oh, bad allergic reaction. You probably don't want to test on a human, right? If it says it's okay, everything else, like, okay, I was going to test anyway. It seems to be a green light. I'm going to go ahead. See what I'm saying? It, yep. it just helps you with that much better. And so now, yeah, I, now we talk about digital trials. Now that just helps you reduce which trials you need to run to validate it. I just, you know, in all the, and I've been thinking about this even before I started the show because I'm, you know, the books I've written and stuff like that is there's no place along the value chain where you're not, you cannot, in order of magnitude, improve your speed, your accuracy make it much easier for people to interpret and understand and set up. And it's just, I, I feel like it's whack-a-mole. Like as soon as we've improved one part of it, now you can focus on the other part of it and technology sort of moving along at the right pace to, to bring that whole thing. I think in five years, the bigger companies that we know are not going to be the big dogs. At least that's what I think. I think that there's some smaller companies that are, well-funded and have the right people and the right technology that are going to blow past some of the larger groups. That, that's yep. just my hypothesis. Well, it's interesting, Harry. I think, um, you know, AI is definitely becoming a tool of science. It's a very crude microscope today, right? It's so effective, right? Or, or you know, like I said, you know, you think of oncology, what's the, what's the number one technology? Like, I didn't expect that answer, right? But that's like the, like the, the fax was 30 years ago, but now video, I think just having this thing in so that they can, focus more on the science and the healing and less on the administrative burden that it takes to make sure that everything's done correctly. So imagine you have a stenographer with you the whole time documenting it. You review it. Thank you. I get back to my science. And that's going to make the job, I think, that much more compelling and interesting. And the rate and pace of drug discovery, I think, is going to go through the roof. Um, and that's why, you know, it comes like FDA. I mean, FDA and others are looking at platform approvals. So think of like, you know, what's happening now, you know, I think my mom passed away from her, um, her two positive cancer. Um, there's trials now where you can do an mRNA based drug, take the 200, I think it's 253 nucleotides, put it into the same harness that was used for things like um, COVID vaccines and cure them. Now cure just means your immune system activates and takes away the cancer, right? right. Um, that's coming. It's in the lab now. And so imagine platforms getting approved. And then personal, and then you go in and you get a personal drug, you know, we're yeah. going to see that. And that, that to me, now that, that what's nice about that is it allows you to prove something with the process. As long as you just change this piece of the code, right. Yes. And then that's the thing. And so there's, and that's like CAR T therapy and other therapies I think are so interesting because that's based on the software of life. It'd be interesting to see how the FDA tackles all that, but you know, would love to see that in my lifetime because I'm not getting any younger. I know, but they're, I mean, it's interesting, you know, as, as they work through that, I think it, they'll do it very thoughtfully and they're thinking about, you know, if that approves it, because it's basically the same process, you're just changing some of the code that's used to affect, you know, how, how these antigens are, you know, are detected. Um, I think that is a really interesting thread that I'd love to see come to fruition. Uh, I, I can hardly wait till, you know, most of this stuff. I mean, it's happening. Like I, again, like you and I said, I can barely keep up with, you know, the latest piece that comes out, it seems, but uh, I feel like we're in a massive tectonic change, like nothing that we, I thought sequencing was the big thing, right? But this is, this is, you know, going to bring sequencing to life in a different way that we couldn't have done before or as quickly. 
Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the cost of sequencing now, that's what's so interesting about these sensors. And, you know, um, you know we're going to get it below 100 bucks, which is really interesting, right? You can do SNP tests are still around that. But, um, and that's just a new data set. But now we finally have a tool, Harry, that can actually reason with that stuff, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to help with ancestry. It's going to help with so many different things. And so now, you know, as it iterates, the next thing I want to work on is that how do you get the, the efficiency of the AI itself to come down, right? I mean, I mean, or to go up. What I mean by that is that we probably, I'd love to improve by 10 to the fifth, 10 to the seventh, much like we do the human genome, right? Because the amount of watts we now need for doing these inferences in the big models are dwarf what our brain needs. Like you think really, really hard and it gives you a headache for a few hours, that's 25 watts. It's like a little light bulb, right? And you know, you train a model for a few months. That's like all the uh, all the output for one car for a year, <laughs> right? And like, okay, there's room for improvement, right? right. But we we need radically new approaches to modeling AI. I think we're going to see that too. But I'm seeing people try and they're they're doing the experiments. They're writing the papers. They're doing the math. I mean, I I'm not saying we're going to get there tomorrow, but yeah, you are seeing good ideas like th that people are coming up with and trying to test out and. You know, I think it's just inch by inch, but we're moving a lot faster than I would have ever expected. I mean, I think, you know, the computational power is going to be in the next five years, 50 times greater than it is today, based on the trajectory that I'm seeing from, mm. you know, the organizations working on chipsets. I mean, you probably know much better than I do where things are headed because of where you are. Yeah, and it's really, you know, from the Keppard seat, um, there are no people going at this because I think the grand challenge is how do you get the, the the watts per inference, like how much energy does it take to actually do an inference, you know, do it to think. Reduce that by 10 to the seventh. That seems crazy. Well, that's what happened in the Human Genome Project. You know, these, these phones we have were supercomputers in 1997, right? We can get 10 to the seventh. How do you do it? We need something radically new. And it's going to be a 22 year old. And she's going to come with this idea because she's going to ask a simple question we've never asked. Like, that is so genius. And <laughs> she'll find it. I'm convinced. It's not going to be me. My, my brain's too wired. But I think that's what's coming. And, um, and we're also seeing people now thinking about there's so much tech debt because we've been chasing this for so long. We have this large stack. It's amazing what it does. But there's people like Chris Latner and others who are looking at this saying, let's rethink this. Can we look at a simple language instead of programming in C++ and Python and CUDA and accelerators? And there's like multiple layers of Turing equivalents all the way in the stack. He's like, how about just doing this with a simpler language all the way to the bottom? Because nature is a lot simpler. Yes. He's at it. He's, he's, I think he raised a hundred million dollars. You know, Godspeed, I wanted to do it. Right, reminds me of the list machine many years ago, and I think that's what's going to happen. I think in the next decade, and you're right, it's going to bring the cost of compute way down. And people are thinking that the first ones that will come out that'll be, you know, oh my gosh, it's so intelligent, probably very expensive and big, maybe a thousand an hour or something. But over time, a couple bucks, you know, right. and you're going to, and they're going to use these in every day. And, you, and I think we're going to have a AI bill, like a cable bill, like. It's going to be like our car payment because well, why are you paying for AI every month? Well, that's everybody does because <laughs> life is so much better and I can do it. Right. And there'll be people and there'll be the other programs. So that I think that's, what's going is that, you know, we do that for entertainment, but we, but we, we put on suits and dresses and that kind of stuff to go to work and, and we have cars take us to work. And I think in the future we'll have our own little bevy of, of, P, of AIs that we train and that's who we become is that plus AIs and that's that's what people will hire is you and your team. Do you know, mm -hmm. if, I, if there's one thing I miss when I was at a place like Applied Biosystems was, we got to ask the crazy questions that come up with the moonshot sort of ideas and think it through and work on it. See if we could actually like make it happen. And you're at Google, so you get to do just that. And if I had to be, say that I miss anything, it's that, right? Because because doing what I'm doing now is you, you invest in a startup and you got to be sure that that guy makes it to the finish line, right? Yeah. <laughs> for for all your LPs. So it's a different, you're not, you're not always, 
blowing out that 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 insane idea. Like I have to do that in my spare time. Yeah. But now it'll be the kind of thing where you have these collaborators and they'll get to know you. And I think we're all going to have that. And it's just, it'll, it'll be second nature, much like searching Google is today. You know, we all, we always Google and think about it. We don't think about the internet. Um, it was magical. Just, you know, that kind of distributed computing we do at Google, that was dreams 30 years ago. Now it's real. And 18-year-old programmers think, ah, oh, of course you program a data center. That's just what you do. I'm like, what? <laughs> of course, machine, you know, machines can read and, and speak and understand human language. Of course they can. That's what, think of that for a 12-year-old taking a computer programming course on a weekend today. That's what she thinks. Of course, yeah, computers I mean, well, can always do this. It's amazing. Th think about like the, the, the tutoring system. I mean, I would have killed for this when I was a kid. Is this thing knows me really well, knows exactly where I'm making the mistake, can push and prod on me to sort of get over that hump. And I could move at any speed I want to. Yeah. Right. So, and, and so I think, there's, I think we're all figured this out together. Um, we're going to figure that I, I I'm pretty convinced we're going to figure this human language function or a darn good approximation to it, much like the rocket flight or, or, or plane flight approximates a bird. Is it as elegant as a bird? Is it as efficient as a bird? No, but no birds ever go on the moon. Right. Uh, Elon, is, Elon will help us get to Mars. So. Oh, the Mars. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's where we're at is that now we have, you know, what's that rocket ship? And we're, and I think the community is just chasing that with it, you know, and we're going to, we're going to get it. And, I, and well, I'm I so think, excited I think, to be alive and to see it, to see the transition, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think right now that between you guys and, and other groups that are like just moving at the speed of light, it feels like, like iterating and moving quickly. I, I think a year from now, I think we're going to see a big profound change. So um, yeah, I, I, I wish it. you guys incredible luck. I mean, that's yeah. all I can say. And we're, we're just one participant, I think, Harry. And what, what I love about what's happening now is that most people are running to a Google and my customers. We're all AI people, right? And we're all contributing. There's a legal, there's a legal and ethics and policy and privacy there weighing in every day, right? There's people that engineers, but how do you actually wire up these new AI machines and, and they're weighing in. Logistics people, how do you get the GPU chips to the right location? They're weighing in. It's, it's a full court press now. And I think every hyperscaler is into this saying, this is really exciting. And all the talk is about what's that next turn of the crank for the cloud? How are you going to build that? And what's that platform we all are going to need if everybody has one of these things and multiple of them? Isn't that amazing? I can, I can see the good and the bad, but we'll deal with, with all of that <laughs> as it's evolving. So it's, yeah. it's been great having you on the show. Um, you know, well, thanks for the conversation. I enjoyed our morning. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're trying. It's um, and it's it's a it's a good team, uh, and and we're all doing our best to help. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. It's great seeing you.